and welcome to a brand new episode of the Long Cut Mafia Podcast. It is I, the Reverend Godfather, the show's main host and front man. And this week we are going back to Paracon. That's right. This week is a Paracon panel episode. And one, no, I won't be rant, ranting and raving about microphone usage in this episode. And two, uh, don't worry, it's going to be fairly informative and fairly good. So um, this week it is... Uh, due to him making the re- kind of the re- request of saying, can I be next, is um, Frank J. Bennett, and he kind of made that request uh, before Otacon. We went to Otacon and had to, I won't say had to, but it kind of, was kind of our uh, obligation to at least launch something, one or two things in regards to uh, Otacon, so... This is since we're returning to Paracon this week, uh, we're we are kind of honoring Frank's um, request and putting up his panel uh, now. And his panel was all about cryptozoology. And uh, that being said, let me just uh, say a few standard things, and that is one. Uh, as with all the panels that we release, whether it's Paracon, Four State, or any other panel that we record at an event, the information and the content presented to you is does not necessarily in any way, shape, or form represent the opinions of myself, uh, my co-hosts, our regular guests, uh, or anybody else associated with the Long Coat Mafia podcast. Uh, these are th- the panelists' opinions and so forth and so on. Uh, and two, uh, I kind of left because Frank J. Bennett, uh, I'm using his full name because if you did a Google search, you'll get a whole mess of uh, Frank Bennett. So uh, because Mr. Bennett was such a fun guy to be around and speak with, with a lot of information and everything else, I kind of left his a uh, little bit of the intro. There was a little bit of a stumbling block with his uh, intro that was kind of put out uh, prior to him taking the stage uh, for it. So, and the the I want to present the kind of the light heartness that he presented uh, to everyone uh, at the show. And what to kind of give you what kind of person he was. He wasn't kind of this uh, straightforward, and he was serious, but uh, but his uh, fun side and his uh, how enthusiastic he was and how relaxed he was. And number th- kind of a number three is that uh, as with the other two um, panels that we pre- uh, put out in the past. Um, I kind of tell, let you guys know and gals know that uh, how much I uh, I cut out, if anything, and uh, what I did to, in essence, edit the episode as por- part of clarity and context. Now, uh, in this panel episode, uh, I clipped out maybe about a minute or two, and uh, Mr. Bennett, if you're listening, it was none of your content at all. It's that... Um, it was strictly the que- uh, questions that was asked and the, so one or two of the comments that was presented to Mr. Bennett. Uh, and for those of you just joining the podcast now, uh, this event was taking place in the local uh, Roundhouse, which is a historical building in downtown Martinsburg and the area where this panel or these panels were taking place was the size of maybe two or three um, football fields, and a lot of the people, when they were, if they were not in front of a microphone or behind a microphone, uh, they were kind of lost to the uh, ambience of the the room that we were in or the area we were in. So, me trying to boost their voices, their questions would be utterly pointless and would be easier for me just to uh, cut them out and then boost boost them in any way shape or form and speaking of that uh, I did boost Mr. Bennett's panel a little bit so you could hear it 
better from an audio stand- standpoint at a medium volume, uh, meaning if you set your volume on uh, 5, you, you're able to hear it better. Um, that's about the only thing I did to it, uh, aside from taking out the... Uh, the the comment and the comments and the uh, the questions. Other than that, it was fine. It came out beautifully. Um, I must say this uh, before we go into the panel, and that is, if you uh, choose to listen to us through either uh, iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Google Play Music, or Google Play Podcasts, uh, because they're always doing uh, updates to the algorithms and to the software. And with system updates, uh, a lot of times iTunes and Google Play Music has errors. So if you listen to us on your desktop, please be informed that uh, I personally recommend that you go to our website and download download our the episodes that way and subscribe to us that way. It is free uh, doing so. And that way you could listen to us in any particular MP3 software, whether it's iTunes or uh, uh, Google, um, not Google, Windows Media Player, and listen to it on your convenience. But if you're listening to us on a mobile device, uh, I recommend using either Stitcher, the Stitcher app, uh, Spotify, or my personal recommendation, the Podbean app. Uh, that way... Uh, you don't have to worry about uh, trying to find us uh, through Apple or uh, Google Play because I say this because when I went to do some yard work this weekend, I went to get a few of my standard uh, podcasts to do, uh, listen to while I do that yard work, plus one or two uh, uh, new recommendations from Twitter and I couldn't get them through iTunes, and so I had to go through their website that way, so that's always a good sign, and kudos to uh, the Conspired Podcast, Uh, they're the ones that was recommended to me, and they do uh, have a website, Um, I don't want to mention, I do, I'm giving them a shout out, but I'm not going to give them a... um, uh, kind of a link in the description but or out do, do a search for the conspired podcast uh we're, we're on one of the uh um shared stories type of ordeal so there's that and they're the ones that i wanted to check out and i couldn't get through itunes because crap ton of errors and i have an old ipod and so therefore I had to download through their website, which is no complaints to them. Thank God they had a website. So I'm going to stop before I rant on, go on an hour ranting about uh, why podcasters should have some sort of a, a, a web-based portal like a website. I'm going to stop here, and I'm going to say, let's roll that beautiful panel footage or audio right here. And I'll see you all on the other side. You tried so and you make me laugh. Who, who wrote this, Batman? Yeah, and Pat did. Oh, wow. What's wrong with that? Wow. I, I've never seen any of this before. Man, that's good stuff, though. You like that? Yeah, well, it'll, She's it'll, a it'll, pro. Do, it'll do in a pinch. I got stuck on he is also, and I wanted to put my own words in it. All right, I'll take it from here. Thank you. <laughs> this hot? Hello everybody, my name is Frank Jacob. I am a Bible teacher and author, and I came up to, uh, up to see you all the way from a beautiful sunny Florida, so uh, I don't miss the humidity, and Lord knows uh, <laughs> uh, you don't miss, probably don't miss it either. I am the author of FlatterByNet.com, have been since 2008. It's a webpage where I can follow news and information going on around the world because I'm always looking for a Bible prophecy. So if you ever look into that webpage, that's where you'll find it. I'm also the author of a new book, The Ghost in Philadelphia, which is something called Paranormal Science Fiction. It's the first time I've ever written fiction, so I hope you go on Amazon and have a look at it and try that out. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, but what I'm primarily known for is my book, Encounter with the Average and Well, and the True Story. 
And in the book encounter, the Avenue Moral Man, a true story, I recount my paranormal experiences growing up in the state of Maryland back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And not just with strange creatures like the Avenue Moral Man, I've also had encounters with other strange and bizarre uh, entities and other forms of beasts as well, among which it would be Sasquatch. But primarily, we're going to talk about the Aberdeen Wild Man for just a moment. For anybody who hasn't heard the story, the Aberdeen Wild Man is actually a humanoid creature I encountered on the shores of the Chesapeake Bay back in 1980, when I was much younger. In fact, if you all keep up with comics, I was that famous Japanese superhero, young dumb guy. Now, for all of you who don't, uh, this, uh, don't know the story, it was the coldest day of the year, February of 1980. Uh, we actually had a half day of school, I was actually in high school. We had a half day of school because the pipes were starting to burst in the Baltimore County public school system, so they sent us all home early, really before noontime. And if anybody remembers anything about the 70s and the 80s, there were over, and check me on this, one billion soap operas on TV back then. Absolutely freaking nothing to watch for a kid. So, and this is how this is how teenagers work. Uh, when you get antsy enough, it doesn't matter if it's nine degrees outside. You're going to go outside and play, which is what I did. So what I did was, uh, I was aware of it, it being so cold. All the rivers and lakes were froze over. So I decided to go to this local river and follow the frozen river all the way down to where it terminates in the Chesapeake Bay, and it's put me here in the marshes. This is actual footage of the area which I saw the Aberdeen Wild Man. And I had gone through the marshes about as far as I possibly could go until I ran out of land. And so I'm standing there enjoying all of God's creation. It's the height of midday. Sun's out. Everything's beautiful. The birds are chirping and everything. And then I got this strange feeling standing there that something was behind me. And then that feeling got more intense as if something's rushing up out one the back of you, rushing up to you, I got that feeling. And then I realized that I can see the birds, but I can't hear them anymore. And I also realized that the tall grass blowing next to me, I can see it, but I can't hear it anymore. And then that feeling of something being behind me got so great, I had to turn around and see what it was. And what I did, I saw a man in the brush on this one island, this island here, which, by the way, is called Day's Island. It used to be attached to the mainland. It's different from the other islands you'd find in the marsh. This used to be mainland. And erosion eventually cut it off from the mainland. And these pictures were taken just a few years ago. It was twice the size back in 1980 and had all these tall trees, the locusts and the maples and all that on it. And in the brush here, which you can't see because it's obscured, was a man staring at me. Now, at first, I thought that it was, uh, it was a black man. But you see, I grew up with black people. I know what they look like, and this was not a black man. Upon closer inspection, it appeared to me to be a charred human being. It, like his skin was just charred black. And he had these large eyes with very small pupils. I couldn't make out a nose, but he had a very small pursed mouth. And he was looking at me like he really hated me being there. And quite honestly, I had nowhere to go. If he had charged at me, I would have to go into the water to get away from him. So I was locked in my place, and he stood at me for a long time. I could also tell, by the way, he was wearing a shirt, a button-down shirt, just looking at me through the brush. And this went on for about 40 seconds or more. And I got a little antsy as about what was going to happen, so I took my hand. I had a weapon with me. I had a bayonet in my belt. And I took my hand, I put it on the handle of my bayonet, and once I did, this creature launched into this giant fit of rage. I thought he was going to come down that path and attack me. But instead, he ran all over this island, back and forth, back and forth, and through the breaks and thickets, I could tell he had on blue pants, which is another odd thing. It's nine degrees outside. I'm wearing a B-52 flight jacket, and I'm dressed for the occasion. This man's out here in the middle of the marsh is just wearing a white shirt and blue pants, nothing more. And I never once saw breath. That's another thing that was odd. And he, this went on for just a few minutes, and then he reappeared back in the same exact spot he was before, looked at me for maybe about another five seconds or more, and then he shot up into the trees overhead. And he proceeded to run through the trees, screaming and hollering like an ape. But it wasn't an ape's voice, it was the voice of a very deeply throated man, running back and forth through the trees. And I'm not saying climbing, I mean running. As fast as my finger moves, 
is as fast as this creature was moving through the trees. Only there are very few species in nature capable of this. Lemur monkeys are among them, but very few creatures are uh, uh, capable of this feat. This went on for about another minute or so. Good a train. I was wondering if it was going to get interesting. Went on for about another minute or so. And he's way up. You saw those trees. Those trees, these are not, believe me, these trees are what's left from what was there 40 years ago. Okay? There are more trees on the island back then. But he's easily 60, 70 feet up. And I'm standing there at the edge of the marshes watching these big cedars and locusts pitch and yaw back and forth from the weight of this thing. Wondering the whole time, is he going to come down, trek down that path and just beat me up? Or kill me, worse. And eventually, he just kind of, kind of disappeared into the tree line back behind the side of the island. And then I didn't hear him for about a minute or so. Things began to kind of return back to normal a little bit. And then I could hear on the properties that surround the marsh, there's farms that surround the marshlands. I could hear the dogs going off on each and every property, one after the other, surrounding the marshes. Which is curious because that's how we saw the Sasquatch back in 75. Just walking along the farms, setting up the dogs, one after another after another. Every farm that that creek he was following went through, the dogs were going off one by one by one. Same thing. That is my encounter with the Aberdeen Wild Man, and where you think that's the end of the story, it is not. Because at a point where I thought things had returned to normal and it's safe to come out of the marshes, uh, there's, a, there's a part where the marshes kind of give way to the trees. And I'm in the woods now. And then I start hearing something walking behind me. I turn, I see nothing. I walk along some more, I hear footsteps behind me, I turn, see nothing. This followed me, whatever it was, followed me two or three miles out to the highway. And that was the last thing. Something definitely followed me out of the marshes that day. That is my encounter with the Aberdeen Wild Man. <clears throat> and as I said, I had encounters with other strange creatures as well, but I'll get to that in a minute. This is the field of cryptozoology. Now, cryptozoology, for those of you who have never uh, per chance to study, is ancient Greek, crypto meaning hidden, and zoology is the study of all animals. Hidden animals, bearing in mind that as technology has increased in the past 200 years, what could be categorized as crypto or hidden has fallen by the wayside. One example would be the Komodo dragon. If anybody's not familiar with that, it's native to Indonesia. And when the French explorers went there, they got all these tales about this weird, bizarre beast that terrorized them. And of course, we all know today, through discovery, you know, Komodo dragons are actually house pets. Cryptozoology applies to creatures unstudied. It's not paranormal. It's just that we haven't discovered them yet. And every day, if you follow the news like I do from my webpage, you're finding that science is discovering new creatures each and every day. Each and every day, especially coming up from the oceans. So, the field of cryptozoology, cryptozoology, and those who uh, participate in it, there are many who are Bigfoot hunters. I am not. Quite frankly, uh, when I ran into the Aberdeen Wild Man, I, there was no way on this God's green earth I was going back to that island by myself. I was just a young, dumb kid. I didn't know my you-know-what from a you-know-what. I'm not going back to that island. So a couple weeks later, I took a very big friend of mine with me. His name's Mike. <clears throat> Mike's about 6'1". And we went back to that island, looked around. Of course, it's winter. You're not going to find anything in winter. You'll find press downs from deer. You'll find duck blinds. But in terms of actual physical evidence, not in the frozen uh, ground, not in nine degree weather, you're not going to find any. No hair, no nothing. And I had Mike stand in the exact same spot that the creature was looking at me in. And it near about the same size as Mike was, about 6'1". So we're not talking Sasquatch this year. As a matter of fact, I am unfamiliar with any story anywhere where a Sasquatch can leap 15 feet in the air. The field of zoology, cryptozoology, encompasses this entire nation. And I realize you can't see that from there. But these images you can find off the internet and look at them for yourself. This is a rendition of something called the Jersey Devil. And I used to have a boat out in uh, New Jersey. I would ask the locals about it. And it's kind of like a big gag to them. But they continue, they claim to still see it to this day. This is a representation of a lizard man, which has been seen in areas down south. And this is a rendition, a colorful one I may say, of the Mothman. 
There are hundreds of other renditions because there have been multiple appearances of the Malkin creature. Not all the same. That's fascinating. Now, this is native home to me in Florida. This is a rendition of the skunk ape. Odd how the skunk ape resembles Sasquatch. However, nobody's actually been close enough to a skunk ape to get a better rendition or photograph other than this. And I dare say to you that from this distance, as grainy as that is, that could easily be a human being who just lives in the marshes. Down in Florida, where it's possible to do so, we have a lot of people living in the marshes. This is a rendition of the dog man. The dog man is native to the northern states, primarily Michigan. But as this map details, the dog man is now being sighted in regions not corporeal to its homeland. It's being sighted as far south as West Virginia, south of here, which I find unusual. But of course, we've got to talk about the big cheese of them all, the Sasquatch. Big cheese, the big kahuna, the top drawer, the first thing everybody thinks of when they think about a strange hairy beast. This is a still from the Patterson Gimlin footage from 1965, 66. And I throw this one image up because there's a big argument in the community about these. Those are breasts, allegedly. And breasts do not mean female, especially when we're talking about what could be older creatures. And it's, a, it's, it's indicative of mammals that when they age, things go south. Not talking more about that, you all fill in the blanks. Things go south. And unfortunately, you want proof? Uh, as a consequence of the American diet, take a flight down to Fort Lauderdale and see full-grown men with nice big breasts wearing Speedos walking up and down the beach, and my point is made. Thank you very much. But breasts do not mean female. <laughs> but many in the community thinks it does, so, you know. You've got to give them space on that. But also the reason why I threw this up is because I've watched the Patterson given the footage over and over again, and having spent some time in the saddle myself, I'm struck by the fact that two men, experienced Bigfoot hunters, on horseback, choose to dismount and try to chase this creature on foot to get this grainy footage. Whereas people like me would go, well, you know, when you spend enough time in the saddle, you try to think of ways to not have to keep getting up and down. I don't understand why one of them couldn't have stayed mounted and at least tried to keep up with the creature. But that's a question that I have to ask Mr. Gimlin when I see him later this year. I guess he has his reasons, but people like you and I, we would rather stay mounted on our horses as opposed to jumping down and trying to run up to a creature like this. Uh, the horses will provide you a little bit of uh, protection, but not that much, because they get spooked as well. This map details Sasquatch sightings all over the United States. This map is about uh, a year and a half, two years old. The concentrations of sightings. And this map, strangely enough, shows the population density in this country. And the two look extremely similar, so just like the dog man, being seen in areas never seen before. As humans multiply in this country, so do the sightings. I'm not trying to render, you know, a judgment there. And of course, as I may have said before, Sasquatches can be real jerks sometimes. They're good surfers, but they can be real jerks. This picture was taken uh, on the west coast of Washington State, and uh, I was there for a Sasquatch conference. Uh, this, I threw this up for a reason. This is one of the most familiar images you can have as a Sasquatch. And it's very suspicious, because we, we don't discuss psychology. And especially for you folks uh, who hunt uh, in the paranormal. Psychology is a big thing. And we're always used to seeing the Sasquatch represented as this gigantic, hulking mass. That's an intimidating figure. Now, I put it to you. What if he was only five feet tall? Would you be as afraid of him now? What if he had a big belly and narrow shoulders? How about now? Also, something that's mysteriously missing is a neck. As humans, in psychology, we try to make sense of what we see. If we don't see a distinctive anatomical, anatom physically correct figure, <laughs> yep, I, I caught your disease. <laughs> uh, we don't, we can't, we can't categorize it. We don't recognize it, but it does intimidate us all the same. And this is just a standard mugshot of the size correspondence to other mammals in nature. And the fact that the Alaskan brown bear is standing right next to the Sasquatch is not an accident because nine times out of ten, when put to the test, Sasquatch is always being confused with bear. In fact, 
what you're looking at right now, sad to say, is the only actual evidence of a Sasquatch ever having existed at all, outside of the eyewitness accounts. Now, don't you find it a little strange? And the, these are sightings of Sasquatch worldwide. And the fact that it is proposed to have crossed the Asian, Eurasian land bridge about, oh, I don't know, about 10,000 years ago, staying with the Native American Indians. But don't you find it strange that a creature of that size, a race of them, have lived here all this time, and that's the only evidence we have of their existence at all, period? It's a little bizarre to me. It doesn't add up. These are Native American renditions of what they believe is Sasquatch, but I've put artwork like this up here to make a point. Ancient artwork is not a photograph. It's interpretive. These are examples of the ancient Egyptian gods. Coming up, this is the Minotaur of ancient Greek mythology. Now, did it actually look like that, or is this an artist's rendition of what they believe it looked like? You may recognize this guy. We have a close relationship. Did Jesus Christ walk around with a halo? Does anybody believe that there's this Galilean that walks around with a big light around his head all the time? No. This is what the painter interprets the character to be. He reads his theology, his own uh, bias into the artwork. It's, it's called interpretive art. When we look at it, we interpret what we see in it. You can't take all uh, ancient artwork to mean a photograph of something. A lot of it could be demonic and we wouldn't know. However, going into the next phase of what I would like to talk about is something called lycanthropy. Does anybody know what lycanthropy is? Speak, young man. It's in that, it's in that class, yeah. Lycanthropy is an ancient Greek term. It applies to a race of uh, Greeks that lived in the northern part of Greece called Thrace, Thracia. And they were called the lichens. And in different phases of the, of the moon, these lichens would transform into beasts. Now, it doesn't say wolves. It says beasts. That's, that's the language. And this is an ancient Greek rendition of a lichen. Not necessarily becoming, and th these are medieval renditions of it as well. Not necessarily becoming a creature, but becoming like the creature, acting like it, living like it, aspiring like it, to attack and draw blood and meat from animals and things like that. Uh, this is another medieval rendition. And this brings me to a very favorite subject of mine. Does anybody recognize Spring Hill Jack? Thank you. Spring Hill Jack is not a cartoon character. He is the world's first comic book character. But he was an actual phenomenon that terrorized London over 150 years ago. As a matter of fact, earliest reports were in the 1840s, terminating as late as 1901, sightings of Spring Hill Jack. And Spring Hill Jack was a humanoid creature who would hide up in the trees and on the roofs and he would swoop down and attack people. He would claw them. He had fangs. He had claws. He had clawed feet. But he was dressed as a normal man. And he had this ability to leap great, great heights and distances. And I think about this when I think about my wild man and what I saw. What could leap 15 feet vertically, directly into the air? It was reported Spring Hill Jack could do that. And so what was Spring Hill Jack? Was he just an anomaly? A strange birth process or something? Or was he given powers, like the lichens were, to be like an animal, to have great strength, great speed, great agility, as they were? Um, when I tried to figure out what I saw that day, and I read about Spring Hill Jack, and I started digging into, believe it or not, this is, this is a comic book I'm showing you. This is the world's first comic book character. A lot of them looked the same to me. A lot of the characteristics lined up for me when I looked into that very heavily. Now, going back to the Sasquatch, though, the best source to learn about the Sasquatch are the Native American Indians. And up here, I know you can't see it, but these are some of the names that all the various Indian tribes gave to the Sasquatch. Among them are names like Owl Monster Woman, Tall Burnt Hair. The Plains Indians would refer to them as a trickster. Now, why would they do that if it's just a hairy beast roaming the, the countryside? Why would they do that? Uh, other tribes would call them cannibals. Watchers of the living. Tall burnt hair. Smelly burnt hair. That's from the northern Indians. Once again, squint your eyes and look at this image. 
and it doesn't become Sasquatch anymore. It looks a lot like a dark entity. And going back to the, to the issue of lycanthropy, when you're looking at a creature, are you like a Sasquatch, are you looking at a cryptozoological beast that has existed for thousands of years and we just simply haven't discovered it yet, that to this day only leaves a footprint? Or are you looking at possibly another creature that was transformed into that image by very powerful forces? May I also state that each and every time the Sasquatch has been sampled, either, you know, gunshot wounds, some people have shot it and hit it and had samples to bring back for DNA analysis. You know, hair caught in the fence, whatever. It has always come back either bare or indeterminate. Always those two. Indeterminate doesn't mean it's something we've never discovered. It means they don't have enough uh, material to reach a DNA analysis conclusion. Each and every time. So are you looking at a Sasquatch or are you looking at a bear transfigured? That when you're not looking at it, it goes back to being a bear. The fact is that we don't even know the beginning of what dwells in the forest. I, but I can tell you this much, spirits dwell there, and they are quite powerful. According to the FBI, more than 1,500 people go missing in this country each and every day. This leads into my next point. And this map shows the various disappearances just in the last year. I realize how far away this is. These are the various disappearances this year and their concentrations. This map shows unexplainable disappearances. And may I go back to say that when the FBI says that there are over 1,500 disappearances a year in this country, that doesn't mean 15 total. That means 15 reported. How many people go missing in this country each and every day? Nobody gives a rat's hoot about. Nobody cares about it. And where do they go? Into the wilderness. These are, these are trail cam pictures. You can find these on YouTube or any place in the internet. But these are trail cam photos, and trail cams are used by hunters to, you know, film game and things like that. Also used by farmers to, you know, track who's been on their property. But these trail cam images speak volumes. These are people who live in the forest. These are people who live wild. And while those are flashing, let me also state to you, it was just, just a couple years ago, I came across a report where hikers along the Appalachian Trail, various points along the Appalachian Trail, were being attacked by wild men. Some naked, some partially clothed, some wearing simply mossback. These are simply people wandering in the woods at night, deep in the woods, miles from the, the nearest house, picked up on trail camps. There are wild men in the woods. There are people in this country making six figures who for no good reason close up their desks, get in their cars, drive to the edge of some state park somewhere, offload everything they have into it, shut the door, lock it, and they're never seen or heard from again. I say all of this because I'm getting to a certain point. But in the woods, not only do spirits dwell there, not only do Sasquatch dwell there, but people who have been driven absolutely insane by powerful spiritual forces, just like in lycanthropy, were driven out of a normal lifestyle that you and I would have, and driven into the wilderness. I also count in my book a story about Merlin the Magician, because before he became Merlin the Magician, he actually witnessed the horrors of war. And what he witnessed terrified him so much he lost his mind. And he accounts how he went and lived in the forest among the animals, and he became like them. And when he would see passers-by, humans going by, he would hide from them. How many people that we report missing sat there in the brush and watched the helicopters looking for them going by, watched the uh, first responders looking for them going by, and did everything they could to evade them because now they are paranoid and terrified of those people. This is what powerful spiritual forces can do. They can make people to become and behave like animals. They can change ordinary, uh, ordinary creatures to appear as something else, something menacing. Or they could become an Aberdeen wild man, a humanoid creature that looked like you and I, and then when you think you've got them figured out, he jumps 15 feet into the trees overhead and begins to run through the trees screaming and hollering like an ape. It just doesn't make sense. But that's what spiritual forces can do. I went through all that to get to this, and I do realize because of the size of the screen you can't see this, 
but this is from the book of Mark chapter 5. And in the book Mark chapter 5, this is where Jesus encounters the man who has a spirit with him. It's called an unclean spirit. But he arrives in this one part of the country, and this man with, many, with an unclean spirit who lives in the tombs runs to him and asks what Jesus has to do with him. And Jesus asks the spirit his name. And the man says, a voice in the man says, I am legion, for we are many. How many here who ghost hunt think when you go into a dwelling, you're looking for one ghost? Or how many of you think that there's only one ghost to be found in any dwelling? And I said this before in a previous video. Jesus encounters a man who's driven out of his mind, lives among the tombs, and the book of Mark goes on to say, and you can't see this from there, but I can, is that he would spend his days roaming the mountains, roaming the tombs and the countryside, screaming and crying night and day and cutting himself with stones, driven mad by spirits. Does anybody in this audience know what a legion is? You live with me, you know. <laughs> Does anybody know what a legion actually is? Very close. Remember, this is uh, more than 2,000 years ago. The big uh, act of the day was the Roman army. And in the Roman army, a company of soldiers is called a legion. A legion comprises a group of soldiers more than 5,000 men strong. So that means that this one spirit, remember he said, I am, not we are. I am legion, for we are many. One spirit that is ahead comprised of over 5,000 spirits driving this one man insane to where he leaves his home, goes and dwells among the tombs, he dwells among the dead, he's naked. They've tried to put chains on him. He breaks them. He has superhuman strength. They tried to put other forms of fetter, fetters and shackles on him. He breaks them. And he spends night and day screaming and crying, driven completely insane. This is how powerful spiritual forces can work on an individual. Now, also I found out when examining the book of Mark chapter 5 that uh, spirits, when you cast out a spirit... We're only concerned with getting them out of the people. We're not concerned with where they go. You might be concerned with getting them out of the house, but where they go after that. This spirit, the first thing it was concerned with, and this video right up here, was concerned with Jesus sending them out of their country to another land far away. So you have to think about that for a second. Proximity may be an issue here. If you cast out a spirit, and it just went outside the house, it can find its way back home, can it? It can find its way back in. You cast it out of the country, it can't find its way home. They were concerned about being cast so far away from this man that they had been inhabiting and using. They, they begged Jesus, Jesus not to send them out of the country. Instead, send us into that herd of swine over there, pigs. There were over 2,000 of them, these pigs. And does anybody remember what happened when Jesus allowed them to leave the man and go into these pigs? Ran right down that cliff and they drowned themselves immediately. And that's my next point. There are all kinds of spirits that do all kinds of things. In my book, I liken them to a military order. In the military, you have a job. You have a designation, you have a job, you have responsibilities. Because you are a guard, that doesn't mean you peel potatoes all day. You have a job. And their job, all 5,000 of them, was to drive that poor man insane. There are spirits that cause insanity. Beware of them, because you never know when they're with you. But there are other spirits that have other disciplines, such as to cause misfortune, loss, anger, rage, lust. There are other spirits whose job is to cause other afflictions. And they're quite successful at it. <clears throat> but... These caused suicide, and when they were cast into a mammal with an intellect not quite as developed as humans, their instinct was to kill themselves. Now, Scripture doesn't tell me what happened to the spirits after the pigs had choked themselves in the water. Maybe it's not necessary, because Scripture has this, has this way of telling you only what you need to know. 
It doesn't really go into detail about things. But it's important to know that powerful spiritual forces exist. So to the point where they can disfigure and distort a human being. They can give him great physical strength. They can cause so much insanity in him where he seeks out the comfort of the dead living in his tombs. And he spends his entire day roaming the mountainside, screaming and crying and trying to injure himself. This is what powerful spiritual forces can do. So is it so much of a stretch to think that we're the only mammals that would do it to? Could they not also do this to the bear, the deer, the dog, the elk? And if they can dis- do this and disfigure a man where it appears to be something other than he is, why can it not disfigure a bear? So whereas you looking upon it, don't see a bear, you see a man's figure, only likened to that of a man, to an animal, covered with hair, in- large, intimidating, designed to frighten and scare. There are instances out there where Sasquatches have been reported to actually have hurt people, but it's about a very small percentage of which, and they're extremely far and few in between. It has been my opinion, having examined more than a thousand encounters, not sightings, encounters. Sightings are different from encounters. Right now, I can see you far away. You're, you're 28 feet away from me. That's one thing I observe, but when you're close up like this, there's a whole bunch of other things that come into play. And when somebody is close up with a Sasquatch, the very first thing they report is the size. That's the very first thing. And then other things will follow beyond that. It's all about intimidation. And I believe this is why we have today, just as the Native American Indians had all those hundreds and thousands of years ago that came with them across the Eurasian land bridge, a Sasquatch. What did they call it? Watchers of the living? Trickster? Gamekeeper? It's their job to roam the forests and protect the forests. There are people they allow in and people they don't allow in. I believe them to be sentinels designed by powerful spiritual forces to keep certain people out. Has anybody ever heard of the Bermuda Triangle? This theory, I believe, applies also to the Bermuda Triangle. It's an area of, of um, it's an area of this planet where, up until recent times, uh, navigation instruments don't work. You go in there, and your navigation instruments uh, get all confused. You don't know where you're at, and you end up in a drink. I believe the same thing applies to this. This is something that was designed by powerful spiritual forces to confuse people and just keep them out of certain areas of the woods. And that's how I explain the Sasquatch, because Lord knows, outside of footprints, we have nothing else to go with. And the personal experiences. Think about it. All these thousands of years, and that's all we've got are footprints? It shouldn't add up, it doesn't add up, and it won't add up. And this is what's going to continue until the last days. We're going to keep seeing creatures like this right up until the last days. Because in my scriptures, all of this goes away in the book of Revelation, chapter 19. Book of Revelation chapter 19 is the end of the paranormal as we know it. And all things in the paranormal disappear in that chapter. <clears throat> now I budgeted, <clears throat> excuse me, I budgeted the last uh, several minutes of this spiel to take questions from the audience. So now this is your time to thoroughly, you know, I'm taping this. This is your opportunity to completely embarrass the living bejesus out of me. Let me start with Lyle. Hold on. This thing work? Yeah. Let me start with Lyle. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Because that man's a professional. That man's a professional and knows what he's talking about. Um, I am a Bible teacher. And this is what I'm bringing to the table. I've searched scriptures thoroughly, looking for exactly what you're looking for. For example... In the uh, book of Mark, book of Mark is an active book. Book of Mark chapter 8, Jesus says that in regards to spirits, that when a spirit has gone out of a man, not a building, a man, did you realize you can be haunted the same as any house? When a spirit has gone out of a man, it is made to walk through dry places. That's powerful. It doesn't do so willingly. It is made to walk through dry places. 
That's an old TV. <laughs> it is made to walk through dry places. And dry is a lot like how it, how it was when you went out to look for something you couldn't find it. The well is dry. You expect it to find something that's just not there. And in the course of this, the spirit says to itself, I will go back to, where, to the home where I came. And it does so. Remember, it said home. It didn't say man. It said home. You are its home. And set up in you, it tends to regard you as its own dwelling place. Ownership. So returning to the man that it came from, it finds it swept and garnished. And that's an old Hebrew tradition to deal with spirits. Other uh, cultures would use something such as fire to purify a dwelling. And every culture has its rituals. Every culture has its rituals. But it finds it swept and garnished. And it says to itself, well, I'm going to go get seven spirits more terrible than me to go back to that place, that man. And it says that that man's state is far worse than it was in the, in the beginning. That's how spirits work. They're bullies. They come in, they occupy, and they believe what you have is theirs. And if they can't have it, they'll bring some more help with them to make sure they have it back. And then it's going to be twice as hard to uproot them once they do something like that. When you think you're ejecting spirits, when you think that you're casting spirits out, just like the spirits that said, don't toss us out of this country, let us go into the swine, don't be satisfied because you're the object of the, uh, uh, of the exorcism is suddenly better. Don't be concerned with that. There's a, there should be an incubation period afterwards to make sure that a reinfestation does not occur. You should be concerned with making sure these spirits are not just out of the house, but out of the darn state, for heaven's sakes. May I also finish the book of Mark, chapter 5, by saying that they had observed, the people of the town, had observed this man they had known all their lives. After Jesus had sent the spirits out of him into the swine, they observed him as being clothed, calm, and in his right mind. Powerful spiritual forces, which cause insanity, once removed, restores a human being to their right mind. Now bear in mind, Scripture doesn't have uh, a mechanism for dealing with psychological issues. There's either right or wrong. And when you're in your right mind, your proper faculties, they know what that looks like, you see. And like with the people that I show, that are roaming the forest at night, being picked up on trail cams, do you think they're in their right minds? Cutting themselves, walking around in the forest by themselves at night, in barefoot? These people are not in their right minds. This is because they have powerful spiritual forces that are driving them. Twisting, distorting their minds where they don't know right and wrong anymore. Does anybody else have any questions while I'm still rolling along here? Does anybody else here think they're possessed? I don't do exorcisms. I just tell you have a nice day, go see Twisted Paranormal at their table. If they can find their way back. Yeah, this is what we're assuming about the spirit world. By the way, you all probably didn't notice, but the, ghost, the Ghostbusters have arrived. Yay! This is what we do not understand about, the, about spirits, because scripture will only tell you basically what you need to know. It won't go deep into these things. But by that one request, by that spirit, you get the impression that he has a reason to fear by being sent so far away. And it's probably because they can't find their way back. You can infer as much as you want to, but that's what I derive from that. Now, there are other instances in Scripture which deal with the paranormal. I don't really think I have time to go into all of them. However, um, in considering how powerful spiritual forces work, please don't be complacent if you think it looks normal. Time and time again, paranormal investigators have taken someone to do rites of exorcism. Spirits have been cast out only to find them back later, or a spirit back later, or other spirits back later. They're only gone so long. If you girls just want to come in behind me and just start dancing, life is good. <laughs> it, you know, don't be satisfied when you look at somebody and they, they look normal to you because normal is not a constant. Normal is interpretive. And I'm looking right at you when I'm saying that. <laughs> 
Uh, any other questions, folks? Normally, I also talk about extraterrestrials, by the way, but uh, today I just wanted to talk about cryptozoology. And if there's any takeaway you have about cryptozoology, it's an ever-evolving field, and things are undiscovered until they are discovered. Tomorrow, maybe next week, maybe next year, we'll find uh, a Sasquatch. It'll be examined, codified. It will be given a genus and a phylum. We'll all understand it like a Komodo dragon, mystery solved. But up until then, uh, be careful walking through the woods. You don't know what you're going to run into. And i got to be frank with you, and I can do that because I am frank. Uh, things I've run into thus far in the woods um, have given me cause to think you shouldn't walk through the woods by yourself. The woods are alive with the dead. Alive with the dead. And you should be very careful how you tread them. My name is Frank J. Bennett. I want to thank you all very much for coming out to listen to me, and I hope you all take care of yourselves. Thank you. We're back, and I hope you enjoyed Frank Bennett's, uh, Frank J. Bennett's cryptozoology panel. And that being said, uh, again, if you have any questions, or comments, you could always contact us via email, uh, which is longcoatmafia at gmail.com, or, and we'll send any uh, questions to Frank uh, that way, uh, we'll pass them along to him, and as always, you could uh, send us questions, comments, or other via Twitter, which our handle there is longcoatmafia. Uh, Instagram, our handle there is also Long Coat Mafia, or you can leave us a message on our Facebook page by going to facebook.com slash the Long Coat Mafia podcast, and while you're there, you can click that like, bu like button and uh, follow us on Facebook. Uh, we always tend to uh, drop some uh, quick commentary on new stories that are happening when w they're picked up by us. Uh, and plus other things, uh, even though we're a little bit more fan interactive on Twitter, and we try to post things on Instagram uh, occasionally as well. And our shows can be found on YouTube, and we post uh, as per videos uh, as well to YouTube. We don't have an official YouTube uh, name in the link, so if you just use, uh, either follow the link in the description. Or just search Long Coat Mafia on YouTube. They'll come up. We do have our shows there as well. If you choose to have them played on your computer in the background. But uh, we do, as stated, we do recommend you, if you want to, uh, going through like iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Google Play Music, or Google Play uh, Podcasts, uh, whatever they're deciding to do now, or using Spotify app or the uh, Stitch Radio map app, or what we recommend is using the Podbean app, uh, or downloading our episodes uh, at from the website, it, just in case there is any problems. Uh, the website is thelongcoatmafia.podbean.com. Uh, the, all our episodes are there uh, for your listening pleasure. And they go all the way back to the beginning. Uh, let's see. What else? And that's about it. Uh, again, thank you to Paracon and uh, everybody else in regards to letting us post the panels, uh, especially Mr. Bennett. And that is it. Uh, as per uh, what might come next week, I don't know. I do have uh, one or two things uh, that I can post up. But uh, I have to check them first before I post them up. Um, and it's mostly because uh, I went to a uh, kind of a beer festival. And I want to make sure the content I bring to you is not only uh, audible uh, from a uh, listening standpoint. it's You can hear it nice and fine. Um, but you can understand everybody uh, from a speaking span, uh, standpoint because, yes, alcohol was involved. So uh, I have to check in regards to that. Um, either way, I'll see all of you in a way 
uh, metaphorically speaking, next week. And I, again, I hope you enjoy this episode. And while you're on any of our social media, please hit that like and or subscribe button because it does help us in the long run. I know you hear a lot of creators say that, but please do so. Uh, it does help. So take care, be well, and uh, whatever you choose to do, be safe. See you next time on the Long Coat Mafia.